This podcast is sponsored by great seminars and books. I know what many of you are thinking. Why pay for a course when I can watch a PowerPoint presentation and get free CEUs through my employer? But how many times do you leave energized or equipped with the latest evidence and even a game plan for how to better serve your patients the next day? Check out great seminars and books in one of their many courses ranging from total joint arthroplasty to comprehensive rehab strategies for the geriatric patient. See how you can get $25 off a live course by going to seniorrehabproject.com forward slash great. Hit me. This is a Senior Rehab Podcast, the podcast for rehab clinicians that want to better serve older adults. Dr. Jonathan Sullivan, welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you for having me, Dustin. So I I first came across you uh, when you were on the Crow uh, Strength Training Podcast, and I was very intrigued, you know, by your story. A that you're you know an emergency room physician, uh, which which my wife is as well. Um, but then you also own a, a strength and conditioning gym. So very very interesting career you've got for yourself, uh, but. How about you just kind of introduce yourself uh, to the listeners and just give an overview of of what uh, what life looks like for you right now? Sure. Uh, thanks again for having me on, Dustin. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sullivan, and uh, I am an attending physician at Detroit Receiving Hospital. In well, the how would you? Uh, sorry, how would you describe attending for those not familiar with that term? An attending physician is, in other words, I'm not a physician in training. I'm one of the physicians who's actually responsible for seeing patients in the emergency department. Okay. And in other words, I, I, I guess you could say I'm a teaching physician. I'm also an associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Wayne State University, hmm. uh, which has an affiliation with Detroit Receiving Hospital. Okay. Um, and I've been there since about. 1992 in one capacity or another, mm-hmm. and uh, that's where I see patients and, and teach. Uh, Detroit Receiving Hospital is a level one trauma center in Detroit, mm-hmm. so we get uh, quite um, a range of patients and acuities. It's a very interesting, very challenging uh, place to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we see patients ranging from, you know, hey, I've got a hangnail um, to, hey, I've been shot in the head. Mm-hmm. And um, so we take care of uh, anything that comes to the door. Um, and we are a referral center for, for burns and major trauma and stroke. So uh, it's really uh, quite an interesting place to work. Mm-hmm. In, in an eight-hour shift, I'll see anywhere between 16 and 24 or, you know, 34 patients in that eight hours, um, depending on how the stars align. Yeah. And, uh, it's, a it's a real, it's a real slice of life, I guess. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, that, I've had a front row seat, uh, to, to witness this kind of, you know, your all's training. And I, I'm sure residency may be a little different uh, from when you went through, but uh, it's it's unfathomable. That's just what, what you all see on a day-to-day basis. Um, how, what, would you, uh, what would you say is the, the closest thing to reality in terms of all the TV shows that try and portray your work as, as this glamorous endeavor? Wow, um, that's a tough one. <laughs> I... I think that um, I, I never really watched ER except yeah. for the first couple of episodes, and uh, I really don't watch a lot of medical dramas on TV. So I'm not sure I'm in a good place to answer that question. Yeah. Uh, the um, the thing with me is I can't come home and watch TV shows about work. Mm. So I come, I come home and I, 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 you know, I, I will never, I will never watch medical dramas yeah. on TV. You know, I'll watch police procedurals or, you know, spy shows or, you know, uh, anything, anything but medicine, yeah. uh, when I'm not at work, uh, ER, uh, the, the few episodes that I saw, they captured a little bit of the, 
uh, of the flavor of it. Mm-hmm. When I I remember when I first saw ER, which is an old show now. Yeah. Um, what they did not do is they did not really give the viewer the idea that emergency medicine is a specialty in its mm-hmm. own right. Emer- you know, pe- you have to train to be an emergency physician. Yeah. It's, when did that come a- about? That came about about 30, 35 years ago. It was in the late 70s that the first emergency medicine resident basically designed his own emergency medicine training program. Hmm. Um, and uh, since then, it's become a very competitive specialty. Uh, medical students who are coming out of medical school, uh, you know, they have to they have to compete for slots in emergency medicine. Yeah. And the training is. The training is both specific and general. As an emergency physician, you have to be a generalist, right? You have to mm-hmm. be able to, to deal with anything that, that comes to the door. But emergency physicians have a very particular way of thinking about patients and common presentations. So we think kind of backwards from the way that most doctors think. Mm-hmm. You know, most doctors I- I- in their office, they see a patient and they think, well, what is the most What's the most likely thing that this presentation can be? They think in terms of well, what 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 is this probably? Hmm. And an emergency physician doesn't really think that way. An emergency physician thinks, what is the worst thing that this could be? Yeah. Right? So so a, for an emergency physician, every headache is an aneurysm. <laughs> every chest pain is a heart attack. Mm. Every belly pain is an appendicitis. Yeah. You know, every leg pain is an ischemic limb that's going to, you know, die and become gangrenous yeah. until proven otherwise. Mm. So, um, emergency physicians are really, you know, professional worry warts. We're real, you know, we just assume the sky is falling until we can prove <laughs> ourselves that it isn't. Yeah, I've, <clears throat> I've, I've definitely uh, witnessed that for sure. And I've, it is an interesting way uh, to to view that patient coming in because yeah, a lot a lot of us even from the rehab side, uh, you know, we're told you know to screen for big you know red flags or or these things that can have massive repercussions, but you know we we're not necessarily uh, doing that on a day to day basis. And I mean, you are just confronted with that with every single patient. Um, something that I've been intrigued about is is just what what it really looks like in the emergency room in terms of, you know, what you're doing. And I think you, you hit on part of that in terms of, you know, clearing for, you know, for the worst case scenarios. Um, but could you give people uh, or explain to them kind of the concept of, of moving the meat and just the current state of, of emergency rooms in terms of, uh, you know, just with the change in payers and just the volume that you all are getting and, and just kind of the pressure that you feel. Could you give people an idea of what it's like, you know, at this day and age to work sure. in the emergency room? Sure. Um, I'm going to I'm going to try to do this without venting too much or <laughs> getting you, in trouble, getting in trouble with my with my employer. But hey, only my um, mother listens to this. So you're you're OK. No worries. <laughs> um, working in uh a busy uh, inner city emergency department is really it's it can really be very harrowing hmm. um, so I will for example I'll go in to to work a shift and I you know I'll barely have time to take my coat off mm-hmm. um, and say hi to the guy that I'm relieving and uh, they'll announce that I've got you know, a medical code or a trauma code. I haven't even had a chance to sit down yet. And so I'll run into an area called resuscitation. Uh, and they, you know, the, the EMS guys will bring in somebody who's really, really, really sick or really, really hurt. Mm. And, you know, I work with the, uh, the residents and, uh, the nurses, uh, and, you know, other allied healthcare professionals to resuscitate that person. In the meantime, I'm probably getting new patients in my module, my care area. Mm-hmm. Um, and once I've got the patient in resuscitation stabilized, then I have to figure out where that patient's going to go, uh, whether they have to go to a medical ICU or a surgical ICU, something like that. And then by that time, I'll have two or three patients to see. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and more of them are coming uh, through the door. Uh, so you know you can you can end up seeing two or three patients an hour. Some of those patients are critically ill and require a lot more time than others. So if you start doing the math on that, you can see how that becomes very, very challenging very quickly. Yeah. Um, in most emergency departments, um, the staffing is inadequate. Mm. Uh, I would say in mo uh, almost any emergency department that you go into in North America, you're going to find that there are not enough doctors, yeah. there are not enough nurses, there are not enough respiratory techs, there are not enough beds mm. uh, in the emergency department. There are not enough beds in the hospital so that um, you have patients who are critically ill and who really belong in an intensive care unit where they can get one-on-one -on -one nursing, mm. um, but there aren't any beds. So the patient stays in the emergency department where they don't get one-on-one -on -one nursing. They get one-on-six nursing. You know, oh. they get a nurse who's trying to take care of a patient who's, you know, got on a ventilator and has multiple uh uh, drips going and requires very careful monitoring, but that nurse has to, you know, has to take care of, you know, four or five, six other patients too. Yeah. So that's no good. Um, the documentation requirements um, for physicians and for nurses uh, are becoming increasingly stringent and increasingly intrusive yeah. and increasingly counterproductive. Mm. Um, somebody, uh, did a study that showed that during an average shift, an, an emergency physician has to do something like 6,000, 8,000, 10,000 computer mouse clicks. <laughs> for, and if you, so, so, oh, wow. what you, so what you have now is um, because of the way that uh, third-party payers work and the way that documentation works and with electronic medical entry, uh, medical record mm -hmm. and physician order entry, when you go into an emergency department now, any emergency department, right? And go into any teaching hospital and look, and what you'll see is you'll see a bunch of doctors not at the bedside mm. talking to and examining and working with their patients. Yeah. Instead, what you'll see is a bunch of doctors basically in a cubicle looking at computer screens. Mm. So that's what doctors do now. Doctors spend more time staring at computer screens than they do at the bedside with their patients. And that's not because that's what doctors want. Right. That's because that's what the system has forced doctors to become. Hmm. So uh, I don't know what you might be trying to get me to say, but yeah, we've really lost our way. We've yeah. really lost our way, Dustin. Yeah, and, uh, and I, just, yeah, just, I just wanted to give people an idea of what, what it's really like. Uh, and it's kind of horrifying is what it's really like. Yeah, yeah. And it's really not getting better. Um, I mean, the emergency department's always been kind of a horrifying, chaotic place. Mm -hmm. It always will be. But God bless America. We found, a, uh, we found ways to make it even more helpful <laughs> and inefficient <laughs> and counterproductive than it has to be. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you were, you know, you, if you were actually trying to design ways to dissipate the efficiency mm. of emergency physicians, you mm. could do better than what we've got in 2015. Man, that seems like a theme in our in our country and in several <laughs> several areas. Um, so, how how big of a change has that been since you started? I mean, is it just night and day, or or was there a glimpse of this? You know, back when you started. As yeah, there was a position. there was a glimpse of it even you know even back when I started. Um, human systems just seem to have a natural dis uh, propensity to dissipate the efficiency of their individual human components. I, mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, but um, with the advent of technology, uh, the EMR physician order entry, uh, I think that the EMR and physician order entry uh, do have a lot of tremendous potential, mm -hmm. um, but that potential hasn't even begun to be realized. Yeah. And um, instead, um, the principal driver for, for POE and EMR, I think, is financial. Yeah. And um, it, it's not there to, make, to, to, to help the physician 
go to the bedside or make better decisions or to or to move the meat, which yeah. is you know the phrase that you started this with. Moving the meat is an unfortunate uh, term that refers to the ability of the physician and the emergency department to move patients through mm -hmm. because there are always more patients coming through the door. Yeah. So um, uh, electronic medical records and physician order, you know, electronic physician order entry, those things don't help us uh, do that. They don't mm -hmm. help us uh, move the meat. Um, so, yeah, we saw glimpses of it uh, even when I started 20 years ago. Yeah. But it, it's a little bit like the old thing about boiling a frog. Hmm. You know, the, the, how do you boil a frog? You taste it. You put a frog in a pan of cold water and you turn up the heat slowly and, you know, before you know it, the frog is boiling. So I can't say there was any particular, you know, thing. There was no particular singularity where it was like, you know, in the old days it was great and then, yeah. you know, such and so happened and now it's horrible. No, it's just been a steady accumulation of crap yeah. uh, uh, that's basically, you know, uh, made working in American healthcare and particularly the emergency department, just progressively more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And I know a lot of people listen to this, you know, in terms of, of just the trends that you're seeing in your field, you know, it, it's definitely happening, happening in rehab as well. And, you know, in terms of, you know, the electronic, you know, medical records and documentation, productivity standards, uh, you know, we're, being more incentivized to spend time documenting than actually, you know, spending time with our patients, but which is it, just unbelievable, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, I really, I, I spend more time documenting a patient encounter, yeah, than I do having a patient encounter. Yeah, uh, that is completely back ass words. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what the system has brought us to, uh, and it's counterproductive. Um, it's really sucking the soul out of healthcare mm -hmm. medicine. I'm sure you feel the same way about physical therapy. Yeah. Uh, and um, it's going to have to change. Uh, I just don't know what we can do to change it because the forces that are uh, the forces that are invested in all of that are tremendous. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. So. Let's uh, let's talk about some of uh, the trends that you're seeing in the in the emergency room in terms of patients. So you know this is a senior rehab podcast. So in terms of older adults, uh, what what trends do you see in terms of you know reasons that they're coming in for you know to seek your care? Well, uh, Detroit's a, a really great microcosm. Uh, for the most part, anybody who can get out of Detroit has gotten out of Detroit. Hmm. Um, I think Detroit is starting to come back. Um, but what we've seen uh, over you know the last couple of decades is that the population of Detroit seems to be getting older, mm. it seems to be getting uh, more impoverished and more disenfranchised because those are the people that are left. Yeah. Um, so we see uh, a lot of older patients, and the trends that I see with these older patients are that uh, increasingly. Uh, they suffer from what I call the sick aging phenotype. Hmm. And um, the sick aging phenotype is sort of a medicine realm um, that I conceive of as being the metabolic syndrome, mm -hmm. which is insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes, hypertension, uh, visceral obesity and truncal obesity, um, and dyslipidemia. Hmm. Uh, on top of that, I think that the metabolic syndrome also includes systemic inflammation. Mm. So we see these patients who are fat, diabetic, or pre-diabetic, hypertensive, uh, and with you know the uh, all the all the ingredients in place for the development of severe, severe cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease. Mm. In addition, they're all weak. They're all frail. They all have sarcopenia. They all have osteopenia. Um, they have very poor physical function. And uh, they all have polypharmacy and medical dependence. I shouldn't say they all do, but this is the trend that I see. Yeah. The trend that I see with people over 
50, really over 40 in Detroit, sometimes people in their 30s, is that they're, you know, they are fat, pre-diabetic, hypertensive, dyslipidemic, weak, Hmm. um, dependent on a shopping bag full of pills, dependent on doctors for symptom relief, and prematurely old. Yeah. Um, and old in a way that's that's really sick, you know, so much so that when we actually see a functional senior, a senior who's vibrant and healthy and not fat mm-hmm. and, you know, has good physical function and has a twinkle in her eye, you know, the, the doctors and nurses all kind of gather around and go, God, isn't she beautiful? <laughs> because she she is, it's just like a unicorn, you know, uh, <laughs> because that's not what we see most of the time when yeah. we see <laughs> so, so it, you're you're obviously doing something to to combat uh, you know this sick aging phenotype. Um, tell us tell us about your gym now, and and just you know kind of what what your gym looks like, and you know your your goals and purpose of it. Well, um, I have um, I have a strength and conditioning business. Uh, it's called Gray Steel Strength and Conditioning in Farmington, Mission, Michigan. It's a couple of miles from my home, um, and what I do is um, what I do there is I train adults in their fifties, sixties, seventies, and it's semi-private training. I have uh, three strength training platforms there. It's a large gym, relatively large gym. It's about uh, fourteen hundred square feet. Okay. Uh, beautiful sunlit space. Um, with uh, three heavy squat racks and training platforms, there's also an Olympic platform. Mm. Um, we have uh, we're set up to do conditioning as well with exercise bikes and um, and uh, a prowler sled. And um, so about eight, uh, Monday morning, Friday morning, about eight o'clock, I open the gym. Clients come in. I can train three people at a time. Mm. And uh, at Gray Steel, we train people in. Uh, heavy barbell exercises. Mm-hmm. Uh, we focus on um, the squat, the deadlift, uh, the standing overhead press, and uh, the bench press. Uh, some of my selected clients will do Olympic variants like the power queen or the power snatch. Yeah. Uh, some of my clients um, have specific conditioning programs. Um, some of them I teach how to how to do sort of you know, uh, kickboxing rounds on a heavy bag, some of them like that. Some of them just like to do the bike or push the sled. And our focus there is to, is to help people, uh, in their fifties, sixties, seventies and beyond get strong and rediscover their bodies and rediscover, you know, the fact that, that you can do hard work and make progress. Uh, and, um, so it's a very, very gratifying, uh, thing. i I find that after working in the ER, which working in the ER can fill you with a little bit of despair sometimes. And so going into Gray Steel and and working with these older clients and watching them get stronger and healthier, it really recharges my batteries and, you know, gives me gives me the the strength to kind of keep going in the ER where I'm not always sure that we're helping people as much as we would like to. Yeah. So. So the <clears throat> your clients, um, you know, mentioned forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, and beyond. Mm-hmm. Um, what what does it look like when they come to you and want to, you know, start this, you know, strength training program? What what are you doing in terms of screening and uh, just making sure you know that they're 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 ready for this, or that you get an idea of how how much to scale, you know, these these different lifts? What does that look like? Well, I got to tell you, Dustin, it's actually, um, it's actually pretty low tech. Mm -hmm. It's actually, um, it's actually a very simple approach. Uh, clients contact me by phone or by email. And what I do is I ask them to come into the gym, um, you know, and meet me and see the gym. Um, it's, you know, for a lot of them, it's not what they're expecting. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so I want them to come in and see the facility and see those great big squat racks and see those barbells and all those plates. Um, and, uh, I bring them in. Uh, it's a, it's a free sort of consultation. 
spend some time talking to them so we can get to know each other. You know, they can see that I'm not a creep <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and talk to them and find out what it is uh, that their goals are or what they think their goals are. Yeah. And um, I, take a, I do take a medical history from these people, which mm-hmm. is something that I know how to do. Um, there are uh, very few absolute contraindications to the kind of training that we do there. Yeah. Uh, so I sort of screen them for those. And then I do, um, I do a, a sort of a screening thing on the platform. Uh, which is really simple. It's not a functional movement screen. It's, mm-hmm. it's very simple. I just basically have them do the movements that I'm going to be training them. In. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, uh, the first thing I do is I see if they can stand up out of a chair. Uh, and if they can stand up out of a chair, I see if they can hold a bar on their back. By a bar, I mean like a broomstick, yeah. you know, or a 10 pound bar. Um, and then I see if they're able to, without a bar, just squat down on their haunches mm-hmm. and stand back up again. And maybe they can and maybe they can't. But basically, if they can stand up out of a chair, uh, I know that I'm going to be able to train them in the squat. Mm-hmm. And then I put a light kettlebell on the platform and I show them how I want them to bend over into a particular uh, position mm-hmm. and grab the kettlebell and just stand up with it. Yeah. And if they do that, I know that I can train them in the deadlift. Mm. And then I give them a, uh, a broomstick and I ask them to hold it up over their heads. And if they do that, I know I can train them in the overhead press. Yeah. And then I ask them to lay down on the bench and I give them the broomstick and I ask them to lower to their chest and push it back up again. And if they do that, I know they can train the bench press. Yeah. And then we're done. I mean, really. Uh, that's all there is to it. I just, I really don't make a big deal out of it. And if they can't do one of those things, for example, some clients, you know, just do not have the shoulder mobility anymore to do a full standing overhead press. Well, one of two, I know that in that case, one of two things is going to happen. Either they're going to recover mobility by training the press with very light weights uh, and getting progressively heavier and heavier in very, very small steps. Mm-hmm. And they're going to recover their shoulder mobility and I'm going to help them get their shoulders back. Yeah. Right. Or they're going to be bench press specialists. Right. And right. we're going to do some other sort of uh, assistance exercises to help them with the limited shoulder mobility that they have. Mm. Or perhaps they can't really squat because of, you know, some particular mobility issue. Yeah. Uh, depending on what they demonstrate to me, I may decide to refer them to a physiatrist or a physical therapist, mm-hmm. or I may decide based on what I'm seeing, because I'm pretty good at this, that, you know, after a couple of weeks, they are going to be able to squat. Yeah. So it's really a very low tech kind of thing. I, I basically have them do these very simple movement patterns Mm -hmm. because that's what's beautiful about it. That's what's beautiful about training people in those exercises. These are just normal human movement patterns and they may be extremely weak and extremely deconditioned and relatively immobile. But if they can just do those four things, Mm -hmm. I know that I'm going to be able to make them stronger. Yeah. And if they can't, then I have to decide, you know, well, Am I going to be able to help them get that movement pattern back or am I going to need to refer them for, you know, for physical therapy or physiatry? And quite frankly, Dustin, it's very rare that I have to refer them. Mm -hmm. I find that when I train those four movements, I'm going to be able to get those people stronger within those movement patterns. Yeah. And getting stronger in those movement patterns has so much uh, carryover to so many things that we do in life, you life know, even yeah. walking, you know, bed oh, mobility. I, I mean, almost anything you get those patterns down and you're, you're covering a lot of your basis in terms of what you need to do as a human being. You really are. You're capturing just about the entire repertoire of human movement with yeah. those, with those four movement patterns. Um, and, it, and then you make those patterns stronger, mm-hmm. which means you make the entire repertoire of human movement stronger. Yeah. So it's, it's really a beautiful thing. So what, what's your, uh, kind of inner dialogue and thought process when you're going to progressively load, uh, someone, especially if someone, you know, maybe in their sixties or seventies, 
and and you know you're you know first you know wanting to do no harm uh you know to them and make sure you know that everything is okay um but still wanting to progressively load them what what's that dialogue like in your head absolutely right well so what i do let's say i'm starting with a lady who's in her you know mid to late 60s and uh you know she's she's done her initial consultation and she's you know she has the movement patterns but she's weak and she's deconditioned. So I'll bring her in then for her first, you know, regular session. If she signs on to be a gray steel client, mm-hmm. I'll bring her in for her first regular session, uh, which is a what I call an introduction of barbells. It's actually a special session where I where I teach her the refined movement pattern that I want that incorporates the barbell, mm. and then I start bringing her in for regular training. And my inner dialogue. Uh, with her is be careful, go slow, mm-hmm. right? You, you just, you don't want to be hurting these people. So I have broomsticks and PVC pipes. I have 10 pound bars. I have 15 pound bars. And what I do for the first couple of uh, two or three weeks, especially is I think, let's just get the movement pattern down, right? And add weight really, really slowly. and uh, so I'll start her out for, for say her overhead press, mm-hmm. teach her the overhead press with a light bar or a broomstick. And then I'll have her do the, the 15 pound bar. And let's say in her first session, she gets up to a set of five, three sets of five with a 15 pound bar, mm-hmm. right? She warms up with the broomstick. She does a couple of warm ups with a 10 pound bar. I put the 15 pound bar in the rack. She's able to press that for a set of five, but her bar speed starts to slow down and she goes, Oh, that's heavy. Mm-hmm. Right. And the first thing I want to know is, well, does anything hurt? And she says, no, I say, okay. I set her timer. I give her a few minutes of rest. I show her how to fill out her log. Mm-hmm. I take her back to the 15 pound bar. She does another set of five. I give her some more rest. She, I, I have her log it. I have her do her third and final set with a set of five yeah. on the 15 pound bar. So now this lady has pressed the 15 pound bar over her head for three sets of five. She'll come back next session. The next time she does the overhead press and where I'm think, you know, where I would with a younger athlete, I'd be thinking, okay, let's add five pounds to that bar with her. I'll be thinking, you know, or let's add 10 pounds to that bar. Yeah. I'll be thinking, let's add two and a half pounds. Mm. That's at a pound, depending on 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 the client in front of me. Yeah. So some sixty eight year old ladies are stronger than other sixty eight year old ladies. That's the thing about about this geriatric population. They are more physically and functionally heterogeneous mm-hmm. than a younger population. I mean, you got a bunch of young male athletes. They're all strong. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's some there's some variation. Some are more explosive than others, some are more, you know, gifted than others, but they're all strong. Mm. I mean, you take a young man, there it's a more homogeneous population. Some sixty eight year old ladies are still pretty strong. They're okay. Yeah. Some of them are really, really weak. So I'm gonna look at the lady or the guy in front of me and I'm gonna think, okay, um I'm I'm I wanna increase her weight because I don't I don't wait. Yeah. The next time she comes in, I will increase the weight on her bar. Yeah. Right. The only question is by how much. And that's mm-hmm. where sort of the judgment and the art of it comes in. So I'll add two and a half pounds to her bar after warm ups. You know, I'll work her up to 17 and a half pounds. Yeah. Or maybe if she's a little stronger, I'll, I'll bring her up to, to 20 pounds. But it depends on the person in front of me. And we're going to go slow, yeah. right, with an older population. Yeah. And, um, but I find that when you do that, right, um, what will happen a lot of the time is you'll discover, okay, I'm going a little too slow. Mm-hmm. And then you can, in, you know, once the, pay, once the client has that movement pattern down and the neuromuscular integration starts to kick in, that you find that you can add weight a little bit faster, mm-hmm. um, at least for a while. And, and a lot of times at first, the clients are a little bit disconcerted that you're not getting the movement pattern perfect before you add weight and they'll tell you about it. It's like, I don't understand why we're not, you know, cause I'm still not doing the exercise right. Why are we adding weight? Mm. And, um, 
And one of the answers to that is because you're still not doing the exercise right. Yeah. And when we add weight to the exercise, it will get progressively more correct. Yeah. Because more weight on the bar will will uh, sort of it, it, it forces the client. I hate to use the word forces, mm -hmm. but it forces the client to do the exercise more correctly. Because the heavier the bar gets, the more the bar wants to move in a straight line. Yeah. And the more correct the movement pattern will become. Yeah. So those are kind of the things that I'm thinking about uh, when I'm coaching older clients. Be careful, but keep adding weight to the bar. Look for discomfort, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, they're, if, the, if the bar feels heavy and they're feeling a little bit of the burn and, you know, they're getting a little out of breath and that's all good. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that's no reason to stop. Joint pain. Yeah. Uh, any sort of physiological distress, we stop, we reassess. If necessary, we refer. Yeah, I think um, a, a lot of people when they hear, you know, that progressive loading on top of a, you know, a, a dysfunctional movement pattern, as some would say, you know, can be very, you know, frightening for them. But I, you know, I would I would agree with you in in many cases to where you know adding weight, uh, you know basically limits you to, you know, be able to do that movement correctly. You know, some, some would say a self-limiting exercise to where you, you put yourself in a position to where the only way you can complete the task is if you do it with better form. And, you know, I've, I've, I've know I've felt that, you know, with, with deadlifting, with squatting, uh, Turkish get-ups for sure. I mean, that'll tell you a lot about how you're moving when you load the weight more. Um, so there, there's some value in that, but you know, I, I definitely see the theme, especially in the physical therapy realm, where we are very, very afraid uh, to load more to correct movement, um, which, you know, can be harmful, you know, if we don't progress, you know, like like you're talking about uh, with with your clients. Uh, right. Not 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 loading is harmful. I mean, these pay, these clients, these older clients, mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a delicate balance there. I You don't want to hurt them. You don't right. want to overload the bar. And then at, at, at what's very, very interesting, Dustin, mm -hmm. is that after a few weeks, the client will come in. Now she's pressing 30 pounds, yeah. 35 pounds over her head. And she comes in and she looked, I've made up her board. This is what you're going to be lifting today. Mm -hmm. And she looks at the board and she goes, 37 and a half. I did 35 last time. Let's go to 40. <laughs> and you go, no. And they start to get greedy because, <laughs> because now they're looking at their log. Their movement pattern is cleaning up. They're more comfortable with the exercise. They know what to expect. They're comfortable with the gym. They're comfortable with me. Yeah. And, and then they start to get greedy and you have to go, whoa, 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 cowboy. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, we're going to do 37 and a half. Yeah. Slow and steady wins the race. So there's, you know, uh, there's that. But on the other hand, you don't want to hold them back too much. Yeah. Right. So again, there's a, mm -hmm. it, this is where I'm constantly learning from my clients, but this is where sort of the experience and the art of it comes into play. Yeah. So we want to keep adding weight to the bar, but we don't want the client to stall. We don't yeah. want them to get hurt. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a real judgment. It's a real balancing act, but we, you've got to keep adding weight. You've got to load the movements and you've got to use progressive overload and yeah. get people stronger. These people don't have time to screw around. Right. 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 A 68 year old lady. I want to get her as strong as I can get her in as short a period of time as I can get her, mm -hmm. and, uh, get her strong. And that's where, you know, the, the novice linear progression described by Ripito yeah. really comes into play. That is. It's pure magic, Dustin. Yeah. It's pure magic. Uh, adding weight to the bar every time until you can't do it anymore. Yeah. Uh, that will get people as strong as you can get them in the shortest period of time. Yeah. So um, it, it works like magic, and just within a very short period of time, the clients, you know, they'll they see the they see the magic of it. Mm -hmm. And then you have to like hold them back a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> kind of cool. cool. You take you take some person who's just really been beat up by life hmm. and, you know, and they've kind of become alienated from their own body and you show them what can happen. Yeah. And, uh, it, it, they're really excited to come in and do the work. Yeah. Just Very opens empowering. up a whole new, yeah, it really is. It really is. So what, what I have struggled with, cause I, I'm, uh, definitely of, 
of the lean to, to load my patients. Um, but a lot of the patients that I work with and many of the people, you know, that listen to this podcast work with are a lot of, uh, the people that come into your emergency room, uh, just kind of that sick aging phenotype or, or, you know, very, you know, just old and frail in a sense, you know, people pushing their eighties and nineties. And, and I've, I've been, I've been trying, you know, but it, it's definitely a struggle for me to know, when to go, when to stop. And, you know, I've been doing my best to progressively load, um, monitor vital signs as I'm doing it and, you know, just making sure I do no harm. But, you know, when you're talking about, you know, the art of, of loading people and and the experience that comes with that, I mean, I just, I, I value that very highly in terms of when, you know, as, as physical therapists working with some of these, you know, somewhat fragile people, that experience is huge, but experience in the sense that you've trained people, but experience in the sense that you've done the movements yourself and, th- and that you're actually training and understand, uh, the, the movements and you've experienced them. Absolutely um, essential. Yeah. yeah. So how, you know, someone, someone like me, you know, physical therapist, home health, you know, that's, you know, doing deadlifts and squats, you know, with, with light kettlebells, you know, cause that's what's convenient in the home. Uh, you know, working with, you know, 88 year old woman, um, you know, has osteoporosis, you know, sarcopenia, you know, just all, just the whole gamut, um, as an emergency room physician, what would you make sure, uh, that you're, that you're checking and watching, you know, as you're working with a client of that, that type? Um, so whether it would be, whether it would be in a home, uh, situation or uh, a setting like mine at mm-hmm. Grace Deal. Um, I'm, you know, one of the first things I tell them is, you have to tell me what you're feeling. And I'm always asking, you feeling good? Mm-hmm. Feeling good? How you feeling? You know, they'll finish a heavy set of squats uh, or a heavy bench press. How you feeling? Yeah. And almost always the answer is, I feel great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but um, if the answer is not, I feel great or I feel good, then yeah. you, you just have to listen really, really closely to your patient or to your client. Mm-hmm. So there are a couple of things that I, that I look for. Um, dizziness is a very common complaint in older populations during uh, weight training. Um, there are um, a couple of reasons for that. Mm-hmm. First of all, um, a lot of people get dizzy for example, when they deadlift, yeah. uh, just something about that, that exercise and what it does to, um, to circulation. But it also has to do with, you know, the, the sort of autonomic dysfunction that creeps up on us as we get older. Yeah. Uh, we find that, the, that um, older clients who have dizziness when they start to the deadlift, they, their, their physiology begins to adapt to it and then they don't get so dizzy anymore. They don't get dizzy at all. Mm-hmm. I still get a little bit dizzy when I deadlift sometimes yeah. uh, or when I power clean, but nothing like, you know, when I first started. Yeah. And so that adapts, but you have to pay attention to dizziness. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to make sure that the gym environment is safe. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, we watch for that. Any sort of pain, yeah. right. Patients, patients can, or, or clients can feel the burn. They can mm-hmm. feel that the weight is heavy, you know, um, but they shouldn't have pain, mm-hmm. right? And in particular, they shouldn't have joint pain. Yeah. They shouldn't have a uh, headache and they shouldn't have thoracoabdominal pain. They shouldn't have chest pain or belly pain. Yeah. So the sudden onset of, of pain, mm-hmm. uh, severe pain, that that's something that you have to be very, very concerned about. So I, I think it goes without saying that if you have a client or a patient who begins to complain of yeah. chest pain or sudden abdominal pain in any circumstance, that's, that's a red flag, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it, 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 if you have a, pa- a client who begins to complain of pain in a particular joint, that warrants concern, mm-hmm. right? The, yeah. The first place you need to look is, you know, at the movement patterns or something in the movement pattern that's exacerbating joint pain. But if not, and if you can't correct the pain by correcting the movement pattern, then with an older population, I think the correct decision is to refer. Yeah. yeah. That patient. So with, with, with older, with older clients, uh, the default decision is to refer. Mm hmm. Uh, and have that pay, have that patient or have that client checked out. Yeah. Um, that's just 
the smart way to go. It's what's it's what's best for the client and it's what's best for you yeah. and it's what's best for your for your enterprise. So uh, you just you just can't be shy about referring people. Yeah, there's there's a lot to lose in in that situation. You know, when we're working with with older adults and you know mm-hmm. loading them for sure. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking, you know, it's your your story. You know, is fascinating in terms of you know you're an ER physician that own a, a strength facility, but I I just can't help but think, uh, you know, just how effective you are working with people and especially older adults, um, because, you know, on a day-to-day basis, you know, in the ED, you're seeing what the human body can handle. You're seeing, you know, the limits of what, uh, people withstand, you know, you're seeing blood pressure through the roof and, you know, just all, all the extremes, you know, basically of the human condition, it seems like. And, and so I imagine that helps you in training as well, because you, you may, you know, have a, you probably have a very, very good understanding of what the body can actually handle. And if, you know, lifting this bar up from the ground is really as dangerous as what a lot of people, you know, may perceive it to be. Um, th- has that been in your experience work, working in fitness? Yeah, I, yeah I, I hear what you're saying. That That's, ab- that's absolutely true. And um, I'm also, because I'm an emergency physician, mm-hmm. I'm really good at telling when somebody's sick or when somebody is um, in some sort of distress. Yeah. Um, so, and I have a, I have a pretty good feel for how strong my clients are or mm-hmm. how frail my clients are. And because I'm an emergency physician and because I've spent my entire career seeing just how rapidly and catastrophically things can go wrong mm-hmm. uh, with the human body, um, I think that gives me a pretty good perspective when I'm in the gym and working with people. Yeah. Um, it also gives me, like you were saying, a, a perspective on how resilient people can be. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, the, m- my experiences as an emergency physician definitely come into play um, in the gym. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not so sure how it works the other way in terms of, you know, when I, when I'm in the emergency department, Mm -hmm. when I'm in the gym, there's always a little bit of emergency physician standing there with me. Yeah. Right. When I'm in the emergency department, I'm not sure there's a whole lot of strength coach who comes. (laughs) Um, so yeah, I wish, I wish there was a way that I could make that happen. Mm -hmm. I find that I spend more time when I have the time uh, talking with patients in the emergency department who are there for, you know, fairly minor, relatively minor complaints. Yeah. Um, when I have the chance, I talk to them. It's like, look, um, you're only 32 years old. You're overweight. Your sugar's a little bit high. Your pressure's a little bit high. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you've got the metabolic syndrome. I explain to them what that is. And then I, you know, I kind of sit down on the bed next to them and I say, you know, your biggest problem isn't your sprained wrist. Yeah. You know, Hmm. your biggest problem is, is that you're fat, you smoke, you have high blood pressure, uh, you have insulin sensitivity, you are on your way to diabetes and heart disease and stroke and morbid obesity and loss of function and impotence and a whole you know, a whole hellish life is awaiting you. Mm. You're 32 years old. You still got time to turn this around. I really hope you do. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, here are the things that I would ask your doctor and here are the things that I would have you think about. Yeah. Um, it always makes me feel a little bit w- weird talking to them about that as mm-hmm. an emergency physician, yeah. which tells you something about emergency medicine and tells you something about medicine in general. Mm. That's a good point. The idea that exor- that exercise is a medicine, but we're still not prescribing it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, should we be prescribing it out of the emergency department? I guess that's a complex question, but my default answer would be yes, but we don't do that. Yeah. Uh, um, and if it's done, it's what probably typically go walk, you know, 30 minutes a day. I got to tell you, six days I got to tell you a quick story. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I was talking to a, a gerontologist uh, or, or a, geri- a geriatrician, uh, a clinician who works with, a, with an older population. Mm-hmm. And we were talking and um, 
I said, uh, well, you know, I'm particularly, he said, you know, in our clinic, 60% of patients meet the criteria for frailty mm. in, in his geriatric clinic. I said, well, I'm very interested in frailty. And I said, I'm very interested in the use of resistance training yeah. uh, in older populations. And he like rolled his eyes and he shook his head. And I thought, oh, here we go. Hmm. And then he looked at me and he said, you know, that's just absolutely the best thing that they can do. Hmm. I said, oh, really? Uh, so, so you agree? He's like, oh, yeah. And he made this like little movement like, a, like he was curling a bar. He did this little movement. With his arm. <laughs> like they got it. They got to do that. You know, it's like, like the, oh, that's the most imp- the, it's such an in- important thing. And, and I said, so uh, in your, in your, Senior clinic, I said, are you are you doing something like that? Are you referring people for something like? He said, No, we're not. <laughs> like, like, jeez, oh, it's like man. you just told me that you think it's like one of the most important things that they that they can do. Yeah, but yeah. You don't prescribe it. It's almost as if physicians said, you know, we've got this great drug mm. that has proven tonic effects in aging and makes people's lives better and makes them healthier healthier and fights insulin resistance and fights sarcopenia this great pill that we can give people but but we don't do that Mm. it's crazy yeah it's just crazy dustin uh so yeah that was a real eye-opener for me yeah Yeah, and just totally lost our way but but i I appreciate people like you that are uh you know on, on the forefront of this of loading you know older adults of you know of really uh getting people stronger, you know, in a safe, thoughtful, progressive manner. Um, and, you know, still, still doing your thing and putting it out there. So it's, it's encouraging. I know it's not the norm, uh, but you know, I hope we're part, part of that movement. That's going to, that's going to change things in terms of how we take care of well, our I appreciate older adult you patients. Helping spread the word. Yeah. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. I know you got to go soon. I want to ask one last question. Sure. Um, if you you had every geriatric rehab clinician, so let's say you know physical therapists, occupational therapists, you know we'll say speech as well, uh, just people that are working with older adults, you had them in one room and you could say you know one thing to them, what would you say? I would say to them that strength is the most important physical attribute in life. Mm. Without strength, there is no life. Strength is the ability to produce a force against a resistance. It is the most fundamental physical attribute. Without strength, your patients cannot be healthy. They cannot be happy. They cannot be functional, Mm. right? So if you have older patients and they can perform any of the basic human movement patterns, either Train them yourself, learn how to do it properly, or get them to a strength coach who knows how to do it properly. And Mm. get them strong, and you will see a transformation in their health, in their lives, and in their happiness. Mm. Help your patients get strong. Prescribe exercise, and the cornerstone of that exercise should be strength training. Mm. That's what I would tell them. You heard it, folks. Get them strong. Very, very wise words from... A very wise man, uh, ED physician, strength coach, uh, Dr. Sullivan. I I really appreciate your time this morning, and I know a lot of people are really going to enjoy this conversation and gain a lot from it. Thank you for having me on, Dustin. Um, I really appreciate it. If people have uh, questions or want to learn more about you, uh, where can they find you on the interwebs? Uh, There are two places I would like uh, your listeners to look. The first is the uh, uh, website of the Starting Strength Coaches Association. Okay. startingstrength.org uh, there they can find out more about us and they can find out where to uh, find a starting strength coach the best strength coaches in the industry um, near them uh, my <clears throat> website is graysteel.org g-r-e-y s-t-e-e-l dot o-r-g and uh, on that website uh, they can find all the contact information that they need to get a hold of Okay. And I'll include those links in the show notes uh, for, for anyone listening. You can find them there as well. So thank you. All right. Yeah. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Real pleasure talking to you. Hit me.
Thank you for listening to the Senior Rehab Podcast. If you enjoy this content, I highly encourage you to go to SeniorRehabProject.com where you can find more helpful episodes, lots of free resources, and to see how you can become a game changer and influence the direction of this movement. I appreciate you, and I'll talk with you soon. But in the meantime, do not forget to stay funky. This podcast is sponsored by great seminars and books. I know what many of you are thinking. Why pay for a course when I can watch a PowerPoint presentation and get free CEUs through my employer? But how many times do you leave energized or equipped with the latest evidence and even a game plan for how to better serve your patients the next day? Check out great seminars and books in one of their many courses ranging from total joint arthroplasty to comprehensive rehab strategies for the geriatric patient. See how you can get $25 off a live course by going to SeniorRehabProject.com forward slash great. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Jaros Collective, a podcast network that's redefining old and equipping healthcare clinicians to better serve our aging population. Find out more at G-E-R-O-S collective.com.